All right, we are live. Thanks, uh, thanks for watching, everybody. If you're tuning in now, or if you're going to tune in later, again, this is Jerry Kaikendall, Coach Jerry. Uh, this is the Dream Chaser Spotlight, where we like to highlight people that are chasing their dreams and and kind of bucking the trends and doing things on their own terms. And uh, some of some of our guests are going to monetize their passions, and some are just going to use it to fulfill their life in other ways. Today, I'm joined by the legend Dale Garlitz. Dale is uh, a legend uh, in the gyms in this town of Missoula, Montana. The man uh, is an inspiring, inspiring gentleman. Uh, we've had countless conversations in the gym. We've we've probably logged, gosh, who knows, hundreds of hours talking over the last hundreds, decade, hundreds. yeah, decade or so. And I, you know, Dale, yeah. <clears throat> you know, I think you know this, but I, I just want to officially say it here: you've been a a huge part of my catalyst for for my life change and the way I view the world. And you have a way of coming across to people that is very digestible. It's very relatable. And, but at the same time, there's a high level of accountability in what you tell people. And uh, I just want you to know right now that, that you mean a lot to me and you've inspired me greatly. And in talking to you, one of the biggest things that, that I've found so valuable for everybody that's around you is, is your story, where you came from, the fact that you've been this type of person your entire life and you are the type of person that just takes people under your wings and you've always at any given time got two to five power lifters around you that you're coaching and uh, you're just helping them reach PRs and competition and state records. It's just, it's just incredible. So I want to share with everybody who's going to watch this uh, and on, and also I'm honored to be here with you uh, to be, you know, a part of sharing your legacy with anybody who doesn't know you because your story is phenomenal. Uh, but I, I'm real curious to share with everybody, or I'm really excited to share with everybody uh, and to pique their, or uh, yeah, to uh, satisfy their curiosity about who Dale Garlitz really is. So how did you go from where you were as a little boy to where you are now, world champion powerlifter? And please share with everybody. I know you're humble and you don't like to talk about it, but I would like <laughs> at the end of it, please share everybody yeah. your accomplishments. And uh, we're talking world records, all-time record, world records, and and in uh, certain federations, he's, he owns just about every state record in the books. Uh, I, I think you do own every state record in the books. He's got national yeah. records. Yeah. And so this guy really, he's, and, and, and there's no one really on his tails. So Dale's just got this growth mindset, this, co you know, constant, never in ending improvement uh, mindset. And he just carries that with him day in, day out. And this is something we can all learn from, this is something we can all be motivated by. So Dale, please share your story. Where, how did you go from little boy to where you at right yeah. now? Sixty nine years young and still chasing records. Uh, your own uh, records. Chasing your own Jerry, records. Jerry, Jerry, I hate to tell you, I'm not sixty nine. I am now two weeks away from seventy one. So I'm oh, a little seventy. Older. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, don't so look a, you don't look a day over fifty five. You don't look a day over sixty nine. <laughs> Jerry, this is how it started. I think my whole life has been devoted to fitness. You know, when I was growing up, I'd read books by Charles Atlas, Jack LaLanne. I mean, back in the 50s, that, that was the guys. So I, I, I pretty well spent my whole life doing what I'm doing now. I've never changed. So this has been a constant. I've always exercised. I've always uh, worked out. I've always competed. It's just, just like it's part of my life. Uh, uh, yeah. So you were... Uh you, you know, a little brief background on Dale. Dale was a school administrator. He was a uh, principal for many number of years, and he was also coaching yeah. in wrestling. So, Dale, you've always been this mentor leader type of person. When do you when do you remember or do you remember a defining moment when you realized that that you had that that inner coach, that inner leader in you? Is there was there a specific time where that occurred? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think there probably was. So this would be graduated from college. And uh, when I was in college, I had a great coach. His name was Bill Kerr. His nickname, Blood and Guts, Bill Kerr. The tougher you could be, the more he loved you. If you get a little <laughs> bit of blood on the mat, he liked you even more. Yeah. I think it all started with Bill. So I went to a, to a sound wrestling program, Fairmont State, West Virginia, about 20 miles from West Virginia University. So up on graduating, I went back to my old high school, and that was uh, Nor Northern High School in Accident, Maryland. So uh, the, my former coach was still there. 
So I spent the first couple years assisting him, and then I gradually took over. Uh, the arrangement that we had the first year that I started coaching, Jack said, uh, Dale, I'll tell you what, you come on in and you be the instructional coach and I'll take care of everything else. So it kind of all started from there where I didn't worry about anything else, but I, but I certainly controlled the instruction and whatever you could instruct the people, that's the program. So I think it started there. And I also noticed at that age that, uh, I always had a real good way of uh, either water it up, watering it up or watering it down. So I always had that ability. That probably came from uh, coaching, working in kindergarten uh, and working with all age groups from kindergarten to 12. So I taught in all age groups. And uh, some groups you ratchet it up, some gr groups you ratchet it down. But I always had the ability to, to – uh, to explain it clearly so that everyone understood. So I and think so, that's where it started. Gotcha. So there's this, if I'm hearing you right, uh, there's this, this uh, <clears throat> dynamic that needs to occur. In other words, you know, you're meeting your, you're meeting your uh, students where they're at and doing right. your best to get them to where they need to be or where they need to go. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Perfect. So you spent, uh, you spent, your professional career in education and you retired around the age of 60. Is that correct? Well, I actually retired several times. So uh, oh, okay. after, after 30 couple years in Maryland, uh, I retired, packed my Honda Civic up with flowers and the bicycle and, and everything else, hauled out, pointed my car west and ended up in Missoula, Montana. So the first time I retired was 2004. When I came to when I came west, uh, my plan was, well, I'm not really looking for a job, but if something opens up that I would like, I will apply for it. So I came out and uh, there was an opening as a school counselor, at Lowell Elementary School. So yeah. I applied for that, got the job, uh, did that for 12 years. So I guess that makes me. I don't know what it made me, but so then when I did retire, I came back for a final two years and did lunchroom duty. That might have been the most rewarding experience I had in education was two years doing lunchroom duty. So well, that right started, there. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So most people look at that as punishment. It was not punishment. I, I tend to get along well with the kids. They listen to me and, uh, I just walked around and talked to kids. Yeah. And so, I mean, that right there, that, 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 that's a big insight into who you are, Dale. Um, a lot of people would have, like you said, considered it an insult or a step down when you know, yeah. you're running the school and here you are, you're, you're in the lunchroom for a couple hours a day. Uh, and so that kind of leads me to my, my next inquiry. So here you are, I'm painting the picture. You've retired for the, your final retirement. You're done. You retired four times. And you decide, you know, you've told me this in the past that you've always wanted, you, you always saw yourself as a weightlifter, even when you were a wrestling coach, when you were yeah. a school principal in you, you like your own words, you know, you would just go into the gym and you would just be stronger than everybody, you know, uh, especially pound for pound. And it was just a gift you had. And, um, and so here you are, you're retired for the fourth time, the final time, and you to put your eye on a different prize, powerlifting. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about powerlifting, as you're you're well aware. People think it's dangerous, and it can be if you're not prepared, uh, which is not the way Dale trains. But you decide to set your sights on powerlifting, one of the most challenging, grueling, grinding pursuits you could, and rewarding pursuits that you could possibly yeah. chase after. So this is why I'm here. I want to hear this story here. Dale, what led you to powerlifting? And I know, you. you're I know you're humble, but you share everybody, well, everybody. <laughs> Let's let's tell the story from the yeah. time that you got started to all your accomplishments. I want to hear this. Jerry, I might not be as humble as you think. <laughs> every, every now and then I'm, I lay it out. So uh, I've heard it. I, I, want, actually, I want everyone else to hear it. So I actually started powerlifting before I retired. Started in 2010. Okay. And uh, I think the motivator was I'd go to, to school and I had this friend named Larry. And I would tell Larry – 
I'd often tell Larry about what I'm doing in the gym and how much weight I can lift. And then Larry would say, Dale, you've got to be one of the strongest people in the world for your age and weight class. And I would always say, Larry, it's a damn big world. That's a bunch of bullshit. No way I can be that. Be that. So this went on for two years. And uh, so I went home one time and decided, well, I think I'll Google that. So I Googled it and, uh, you know, you can find anything you want on the web. So I went back to school the next day and I said, Larry, you damn well might be right. <laughs> so that, that was that was the start of my powerlifting. So uh, so uh, uh, 2010, I entered my first powerlifting meet, and of course, the first thing I did before that, I found myself. A- Got this. you you there. Oh. Okay. So so the first thing I did, I found. Found myself you should coach. have told them to watch. Coaches. Always been a coach my entire life. So so I know the power of a coach. Yeah. So you need to learn how to do things. And uh, when I think of coaches, I'm always looking for someone smarter than me. Mm. And uh, I had a pretty good knowledge myself. So 2010, I have a pretty good training cycle when I'm headed for, I think it was in Detroit. And uh, nationals, national something. So two or three weeks before I went, I had a shoulder injury. You can you can figure out what that does to your bench press. Yeah. Yeah. It took me from about a what I was hoping for, a 255 to 260 bench press of 148 pounds, right down to I had trouble pressing the empty bar. So that's 45 uh-huh. pounds. So yeah. within two weeks, I was back up to 66 pounds. And uh, by God, I'm on the way back now. So uh, I did go to the meet. So I don't quit. If I sign up for something, I'm going to do it. So I went to the meet, and my bench press was certainly nowhere around what I was capable of. And uh, surprised me, I set a world record anyway. And I was with my son, and I looked at him, and I said, Eric, I don't want my name beside that record. So my first world record, I didn't even claim. So I did not do the paperwork. So that was the first one. Now, uh, after that, a whole lot of things have changed. So uh, I continued to train real regular. And believe me, they were grueling workouts. Nothing comes easy. If you want something, you got to go after it. So uh, within the next, uh, up to present, I've, uh, I wrote some of these things down. I didn't realize how many they are. So, yeah. uh, of course, I have many, many state records. I have no idea how many. I don't even count yeah. them. Yeah. I have 50-plus 50, 50 world records, 50-plus national records. I have an all-time world record squat uh, lifted in many federations. So these records aren't just one federation. Uh I always believe spread the joy. Yeah. So I, so I, I lift in, in many organizations and real successful in all of them. Uh, I've lifted in two different weight classes. Uh, as a member of the USA Powerlifting Mas- Masters National Team, that was 2019, which really set me up to go to an IPF world, which that's, that's top shelf. You can't get much higher than that. Yeah. But that was 2019, which would qualify me for 2020. We know what happened in 2020, so that did not happen. Yeah. Also, uh, international elite lifter, uh, surprisingly, you know, when I started at age 60, I mean, I, I knew there's different classifications. I knew there was international elite, elite, masters, level one. Regardless of how I'd add the totals up, I just couldn't get to where I wanted to be. Uh, so this year to meet, my, my total would have uh, had me internationally meeting like three different age groups going down. Uh, also had me meet like 50 to 59, uh, the age group and age that I am now. Not only did it have me internationally meet 67, 0.5 kilogram class or 148. It also took me out this way 
two or three weight classes. So that's some of them. Uh, how about if I share some of my best lifts and stuff? Yeah, let's do that. Let's that do that. Good? Yeah, so, would, so you mind taking, would you mind taking a couple minutes, Dale, and just kind of explaining to everybody how the federations work? Because you, you talk about a bunch okay. of different federations. So uh, okay. for people watching at home, they might not understand. They might just think, you know, it's like the NFL or the NBA, right, where there's just there's just one professional league. But but yeah. just briefly okay. kind of touch up on how the how the uh, how the federation system works in powerlifting and competitive powerlifting. OK, so when we talk federations in powerlifting, there's many federations. So uh, some of them that I've competed in would be USA Powerlifting, 100% uh, Roll, Wobdoll, USPA, WPC, AWPC, APF, A APF, IPL. Uh, that's pretty well the bulk of them in the U.S. But but the, but there's many more. There's many right. more. So each federation like it's each federation's like its own organization, correct? Kind of like right. Yeah. And they have their own and they have their own records and their own okay. rules. Uh, uh, each federation does have their own rules, but the vast majority of the rules are the same for all. Gotcha. Gotcha. There's just very few differences between federations. So uh, powerlifting, there would be three events. You have the squat, the bench, deadlift, and total. When you go to a meet, you have uh, for squat, you'd have three attempts, uh, bench, three attempts, deadlift attempts. There's also a total. And uh, you have three officials sitting on each side. You're using uh, good equipment. You, you, you weigh in before the, the meet, and uh, it goes like that. Gotcha, gotcha. And when uh, Dale talks about total, that's the, that's the sum total of of his best lift in all three of those major lifts. So his, his best squat, successful squat, his best successful deadlift and his best successful bench press go towards his sum total. And whoever gets the best sum total yes. in their weight class wins the meet. So that's, that's what Dale's been able to accomplish. So Dale, yeah, please share some of your, some of your best lifts with us. And, yes. and, and for everyone yes. out there, okay. Dale, so, Dale so, started your sport. Oh, go ahead, Dale. Yeah. I was just gonna so, tell everybody real quick that you started this sport at the age of 60 and he's an all-natural lifter so there's there's a lot of drug athletes in in powerlifting but dale's been all natural this whole time and 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 you're gonna Jerry, find out why Jerry, i'm having stuff. trouble with my audio stuff am i cutting out okay so i started age 60 so that the first okay so Drug free. So when we look at the this one, uh, lost him. Okay, we lost Dale here. I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to him, have him sign back in. There he is. Okay, I. All right, here we go. So here we go. We're going to start this one. I'll try to put it up so you can see it. You might not be able to. But uh, the first one is best roll bracket, best roll totals. And the source comes from openpowerlifting.org. Uh, th and I want you to watch how the totals increase as I get older. So in the 60s, the 64 age group, my best total was 903 pounds. Uh, that would have been good for a ranking of number 27 in the world. 65 to 69, 942 pound total. That would be good for number 11 ranking in the world. Age 70, that was this year, 959 pounds. That's good for a ranking of number two in the world. Uh, 165 pound class, and I, I only lifted in that age age group a uh, couple years. My best total 997, good for a ranking of number 18 in the world. 163 pound class, uh, 976, good ranking for number 10, and that was at 70. 
Okay, uh, these are some of my best lifts. And I also want you to notice the, the age on them. So, you know, so you think of a lot of people. We've been programmed with fake news that the older you get, the weaker you get. That yeah. you just can't do it. Well, yeah. I'm, and I always thought they were following the wrong people around. So yeah. um, that would be this. So 148-pound class. This is ages 60 to 70. My best squat was 347 pounds. Now, this is raw. This, this is not equipped. Age 70. So that wouldn't happen this year. My best bench, I don't know what happened there. I was 66 and had a 237. I think that will be changing in the near future. Best deadlift, 391, age 70. Uh, best total, 959, age 70. 165-pound class, uh, squat, 363, age 68. Bench, 253. Age 69, deadlift 402, age 69, and 997 at 68 total. I also had some, a uh, so couple comp, for there for a couple years I was, I was lifting with knee wraps. And uh, knee wraps, I mean, I got as much 50, 60 pounds out of knee wraps, just putting mm -hmm. them on. Yeah. So 148 pound class. This is 65 to 69. I was 66 at this time. Mm -hmm. With wraps, I had a 392 pound squat. Uh, so that was good for an all time world record and an all time American record. My best total was uh, 992. That had been ranked. Number six in the world, 165 pound class. I had my best total, 1019, and that would have been good for number 18 in the world. So, broke the thousand pound. I don't know. So, I think the thing that's real consistent there is that as I get older, my lifts go up. And, yeah. and I think I know why. Yeah. So, and we'll touch, I want to touch up on that too, Dale. So, but briefly, uh, you know, you mentioned the, uh, you mentioned the aging thing and, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in my early forties now and much like yourself, you know, I don't think I've, I've felt better, uh, been able to perform better, had more energy than I ever have right now. And so I'm like you, I, I think a lot of people subscribe to an improper model of aging. It's one that's been shown to us, uh, by a lot of our family members, friends, you know, people we see, and we just kind of watch people you know, they're not even aging for the most part. There's a lot of decay going on. They just, they yeah. start the decaying process because they don't nurture what's important. Uh, so, and then on top of that, there's a lot of uh, fear of injury for people when they, when they step in the gym. And you and I have, yeah. I have talked a lot about this, about proper movement patterns and, and how, you know, some people, you know, brushing their teeth and reading a book <laughs> and laying in bed could just yeah. be horrible on their back. In particular, you know, the hinge or bend pattern and the squat pattern. So you want to touch base briefly on how much attention you pay to proper movement patterns and correcting any deficiencies that you see before you start loading the bar up. Okay. You know, and I think the way I'm going to do this, I'm, I'm going to do, do some, some little squats for you. So That'd be great. So, so let's pretend that uh, let's pretend that, that I'm having a squat session. So when I go into the gym, my thought process is that I need to be moving properly, okay? So my warm-up consists of doing movements that prepare me to squat. Now, my warm-ups aren't long. I mean, so uh, the overall goal when you go to the gym is to start working out. So mm -hmm. don't sabotage it by spending 40 minutes warming up. I mean, it mm -hmm. doesn't take me that long. So just using, uh, let me find something here. I'll use this. So I'm going to have to back up a little bit. So the first thing I like to do is make sure that I'm squatting properly. So the way I do that, I just go straight to an old air squat like this. Mm -hmm. Get back and squat down. And so things that I'm checking here. 
Uh, I'm certainly checking my back angle. I want that to be neutral. I want to make sure my hips aren't hurting. I want to make sure my, my muscles are firing. And, uh, you know, if they're not firing when you're doing that, you probably shouldn't get under the bar. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the first thing I would do. I would certainly I go through my movement patterns to make sure that everything's functioning properly. And mm -hmm. uh, so, so like if I'm squatting, uh, the way I'd like to keep moving properly is that I tend to break things down into movement patterns. So uh, if you're thinking of the squat, too many people go to the gym and they think of the squat as the squat, just one thing. Yeah. So you got to do a lot of different things to uh, be able to squat. So I, so I break it down with things that I need to do before I unrack the bar, things that I do after I unrack the bar. So, uh, and they're all movement patterns. So, so I don't know how many times I'd go to the gym and I would just practice movement patterns for the squat. So the first thing, I know I need to put my hands on the bar. So, and when I put my hands on the bar, they need to be at the proper place because you got to tighten up that upper back. You need to get the lats involved. You need to create a shelf. So I practice things like that. Maybe that's, I practice that for five minutes. Then I, I need to get under the bar. So I need to get set up properly. I need to get wiggled in. I need to get the bar properly. Uh, that's another movement pattern, the setup. I need to brace. I need to brace properly, getting the air in. That's another movement pattern. Then you need to un you need to unrack the bar. That's another movement pattern. Then you have to walk it out. And I, I like it. Two or three step. One, two, three. Check my feet. Then I always like to stand tall like this. Get everything locked in. Uh, then at that point, you're waiting for the official's commands. you got to have everything locked in. Your knees need to be locked. You need to have control of the board. When the ref would say squat, well, then I reinforce everything again. I reinforce this. I reinforce my brace, and then I squat. So, so, uh, I, so, so certainly by doing that, I think I prevent myself from getting injured. Yeah. But, going over all the different movement patterns, starting with just an air squat before you even go to a kettlebell. Mm -hmm. And if you can't do them, well, then there's no need to get under the bar. Yeah, yeah. And that's a very that's a very good point. And then for you, you're doing this, all this to maximally uh, apply force to the load so that you have the best chance of a successful attempt. Yeah. And, and But one thing, one correlation I'm drawing here is is your first thing is bracing, getting your spine protected because we only have one spine, right? It's very important. Yeah. And so many people in the aging, uh, in the in the aging group, uh, they they don't move with much intention. So there's a lot of lower back injury potential, you know, just in going throughout their day. What are some things that maybe some people can think about? I mean, we're we're, let's, let's, we're talking to people that don't get under the bar, that don't lift weights, but they do sit down, they do get up, they do bend down to pick up a bag of laundry. What are some things that you could share with people that could help them? I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what. Let's go to uh, hip hinge. And you, I yeah. think you call it the push. Let's go ben. to that. So, so this, is going to be, this is going to be excellent. So, so probably one of the, what, the greatest thing that you can do to keep from getting injured is to have the correct back angle. And that looks like this. This is a neutral back, straight up and down. When we look at the curvature of your of that, it goes like this. Here's your shoulders, slight angle down here, and then back out to your hips, down and back. So that's the angle that you need to keep. So even using the hinge, the, the, the hinge sets you up for that. So, so here's an example of a hinge. Okay, I need to sit down on a chair. Butt back, straight down, hinge. Need to go to, to the use the toilet. Butt back, straight down. Now, uh, I've been to China a number of times, and the hinge is so important in China because 
many places you do not have toilets. They have like a hole in the floor. So, uh, so I think that's maybe when I really became aware of it. So when you hinge in China, I'll get up on this so you can see it. So when you hinge in China, you got to really hinge. You got to go back, down, in, right there. Okay. So now as, as you see that, you notice that my back is always neutral. Yeah. My back angle doesn't change. Right. So just check that out again. I'm going to show you a couple of ways you can mess this up just by even doing an air squat. So as, as I'm squatting down, I want you to notice the back angle. But notice my chest is also up. If, yeah. So the chest is up. Back angle is good. Now I can mess it up, but see how I rolled my shoulders forward? Yeah. Okay, so that automatically have a butt weight back here. Yeah. And in extension. So it's here. So uh so the let me move this. Go yeah. and move over here now. Okay. So that's a beauty. What's beauty? That rack. Oh, oh, I will get to that in a little bit. So <laughs> the hinge, the hinge looks like this. The hinge is nothing more than moving your butt back. And it creates stability for so many lifts. How, how you pick things up. So the butt would look like this. Butt back. Notice my neutral back all the time. Yep. Yep. Butt back. So if I be picking something up, you know, we all pick things up. We go to the yep. grocery store, and then you need to you need to uh, carry them in. So it'd be butt back. Pick it up. I'm not picking it up with my back like this. Right. So I think maybe one of the best demonstrations for that would be this. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. Yep. So let's uh, – can you go in your bedroom and you open your clothes dresser, pull the drawer out? So – a good hinge pattern, a good way to learn it, is to close it with your hips, the hip yeah. hinge. And I want you to also notice my back always stays neutral. So I'm going to need to, so there it's closed, there it's open. need to mm -hmm. close it. So I get here, hinge back, push it back, it's closed. Yeah. So closing a drawer, that's the same pattern. Now, I tried to do this wrong, but it just doesn't work right if you don't keep your back. Like, you hunch it over, you're already in the wrong position, so you got to push it back. Okay. That's a great demonstration, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so. And I see that, uh, that hinge pattern. You know, for me working with clients, that and the squat are the two, two biggest areas of opportunity and, and – what Dale's touching up on there is is his lower back, that curvature. It's your it's your lordosis, your lordotic curvature in your in your lumbar. And the reason why it's so important to maintain that is because as 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 we put load on the spine, and if if this is my lordosis like this, and if I go in and I lose the ability to keep that in the range of mo or in this curvature as I move through range of motion, and it does this, it puts our spine in a in a, a position of flexion where where right. Uh, we're putting load on the vertebrae and it's actually forcing disc pressure to, to move posteriorly towards your, towards your uh, spinal nerve, which is where all the people with back pain, they, they have debilitating back pain. And that's a lot of time what's going on. And folks, if, if you try this at home and you're having issues and you can't perform the bend and the squat pattern appropriately, go seek out some physical therapy, you know, shoot, give me a call, reach out to me. We can see what we can do. A lot of times that's, that's caused from tight hips, tight hamstrings, as you're trying to squat down, your hamstrings are pulling on your pelvis, which causes your pelvis to, I'm sorry, I'm backwards on my camera here, causes, your, you know, if you picture the hamstring pulling here and as, as the hamstring gets lengthened through bending the legs and going into that squat pattern, if it reaches its end range of motion, which doesn't match where you should be at parallel, then it starts pulling on your lower back and creates this, this effect. And it, it won't do you any good to stretch it right then and there because you, your body is used to it being a certain length. So these things are very important, and especially the examples yeah. that Dale gives, carrying in groceries, yeah. 
and picking up laundry, this is where the injury occurs. It's just like picking yeah. up a scab. So that's a great yeah. point, Dale. Would you, uh, would you mind giving everybody a – oh, go ahead. Uh, it, it, for, for older people, picking up their grandchildren. Yes, grandchildren, yes. Yeah. They're squirming, they're yeah. moving. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what we don't what we don't want is we don't want people not picking up their grandkids because they're afraid of injuring themselves. So these things are repairable. You can you can you can strengthen, you can grow, you can lengthen, you can do all that stuff. Don't give up on yourself. Um, but, Dale, I would love to see you demonstrate a squat with a bar on your back. So if you, do you have a minute to kind of show everybody what it looks like? I, I do. But I tell you what might yeah. be a better demo to for yeah. this one would be a deadlift. Oh, yeah. Do you want to do hinge? Yeah, dead, sure. The deadlift, and I can also demonstrate a squat. You do, but, do uh, either. Yeah, either one. Whatever. Uh, the, so, the hinge is definitely definitely a dangerous yeah. move for a lot of people if they're not doing it properly. Yeah. So you just have to, you just have to do it. You know, I was working with my sister, cancer survivor, and uh, we worked on this hip, hinge hip all the time. She was fairly non-athletic. So within, I don't know how long we worked together, but uh, – She's older than I am. She's like 73. So we were doing the squats. We got into resistant bands. I had her doing deadlifts properly with resistant bands. Everything was within, within things that she could do. And she made a lot of progress. Uh, so, so we're going to... Uh, I'll roll this one out. Can you, can you see? The, I can only see the one back plate. I'll tell you what. How about if I adjust like this? That looks great. Now you, now you can you see. Go. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So there. So uh, with the deadlift, deadlifts do seem to cause a number of people problems. Uh, in my opinion, most of those problems are because they're not setting up properly. Mm -hmm. They're not maintaining that neutral back. If you get that neutral back proper, you can lift things. If you're bent over like this, well, you can see it's not, it's, you're going to hurt yourself. So the way I go up, and I'm going to do this with the hip hinge. So notice the hip hinge. The hip hinge is going, is going to get everything moving. So first of all, I push my hips back, hinge, and keeping a neutral back right there. So notice my back is neutral. Now when I start to lift, it's just up. So now if I'm bent over like this, man, that even feels heavy. Yeah, so, yeah. So with this one, the neutral back would be hinge back. Notice the back staying neutral, flat. Grab the bar and maintaining that neutral up. I, I really like what I see in your back there. I like what I see in all the way from the from your sacral spine all the way through your cervical and your neck yeah. there. It's all one kinetic chain. And if you notice the way he lifts, yeah. there's no opportunity for that kinetic chain to break down. Right, right. Now, now have, has my back ever hurt? Well, yeah, it has. And... When I can trip, it, believe me, it doesn't hurt now. I don't know the last time I was injured. I, I, it just seems like I don't get injured. Mm -hmm. That's probably because I'm very aware of how my how I'm moving, how my body is moving in space, and how I'm getting ready to lift. Uh, yeah. So, and of course, that's that's part of the warm up. If you're not moving properly, there's probably no need to go lift the bar. Yeah. 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 That's a great point, folks. He Notice how he talks about how he's very aware of how he's moving. And, and I think we all can apply that. And if you find yourself in the gym focusing on this stuff for several hours a week, it's much easier to apply that to the rest of your life. But it's it's still very much more uh, very, very realistic. And it's something you should expect to yourself as you go through your day. You know, how am I moving? How am I been? If you don't know how to do it, go get some help, guys. I mean, you only get one spine. And if you don't. Yeah. If you don't move mindfully and you don't move properly, it's it's not a yeah. matter of if it's a matter of when that that yeah. back trouble is going to hit. Jerry, so like when I go to the gym, I work with a lot of people. But if I now I don't go around say, hey, you want me to do this? You want me to do that? So I don't butt in. But 
over the course of 10 years, I have helped many people. Yes, and yeah. They all seem like they're, they're very grateful. I had this one guy, uh, Alex, and you probably know him. I remember so, Alex. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so anyway, uh, I coached him up for his first powerlifting meet. Took him to the powerlifting meet. We had a great time. He went there and he set records. So yeah. he started. To re, he started to refer to me as the people's coach. So <laughs> I, I, I thought that was cool. You know, that many people can't afford a coach. Uh, no. So, no. so the people's coach. So yeah. I'm going to the squat now. Okay. Now, can you see? Can you? Uh, I can see you. How about, yeah, you might. How about if I move this thing forward? Yeah, give, her a, give her a little shift. How do I do that? Other way, Dale. Oh, uh, I know where I'm going. Oh, you got it? Okay. <laughs> there. Now, there you go. Got her? Yep. Now, the only problem with this, you're not going to be able to see the back angle. Because we can see your setup. I'd have to turn the rack around, and I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Right yeah. Okay, so... Uh, we're going to just talk you uh, talk you through how I do a squat. Sure. So I, I don't just walk up and throw the bar on my back. I mean, I, I have I have a stead of uh, uh, not a stead, a list of steps that I go through. So from lifts, I visualize things, and then when I go to a meet, it just happens automatically. Mm -hmm. Because I've done it so many times. Yeah. So I know when, when I go up to a bar, I know the first thing that I'm going to do is put my hands on the bar. And they need to be correct because if they're too wide, you're losing power. If they're too close, you're losing power. So, uh, you know, often you'll read people who say, well, you bring your hands in as close as mobility allows. I, I don't necessarily believe that because I can bring my hands in like that. But yeah. I'm using strength. Yeah. So what you need to be able to do, uh, placing the hands on the bar is important so that when you pull down on the bar like this, you need to be, your hands need to be at the length, at the position where you can generate a whole lot of force. And turning sideways here, when I pull down, I want you to notice what happens to my chest and my back. So here. So here it is now. See the chest? Yeah. I mean, it's really engaged now. The up back. and out. Up and out. Up and out. Yep. So, uh, hands on the bar, and you need to, under the bar, feet about mid midpoint for the, for the weight. Then, competition, I always like to pop my nose on it. That's my signature. Then I get under, under the bar. Make sure uh, my joints are all lined up properly. That's hand over my wrist, my wrist over my elbow. And then here I wiggle it in tight, get a good brace. Then I pop it up. So that's then two, three steps back. One, two, check my feet. Then from here, I'd be waiting for a command or the ref would say squat. Then I'd reinforce again, pull down on the bar, and then hinge back, then straight down. And then back, back down. Up. And it should look smooth. That's great. Looks so, great. That has served me well for many years. Yeah, that looks fantastic. And in the the <clears throat> the uh, stigma around powerlifting about it, you know, being injury causing sport is, you know, it's partly true. But it, that's that's more for like the high end, really, the ultra competitors that are always pushing the limits, and then also the people that don't really train powerlifting. I mean, they go do powerlifting moves, but they're not trained yeah. powerlifters. You know, a powerlifter goes through accessory lifts. They go through what we would call corrective exercises in my field. 
And, and so it's all about the proper movements. And Dale talks several times about bracing and that he, he has a certain uh, ritual with his breath before he, he drops into the hole. And, and that's all in a measure to keep everything at a, at a level of integrity to where the whole system, the kinetic chain doesn't break down. And a big part of that, that bracing uh, uh, aspect is protecting the spine. And so at the end of the day, if you guys don't take anything away from this, take away that your spine is so important. And if you're moving in properly, yep. especially in the hinge, in the squat pattern, you're asking for trouble. You're asking for trouble. Yep. Yep. Well said, well said. So, you know, in powerlifting, uh, most of your injuries happen because of two reasons. Improper movement patterns and improper load. So you, you don't throw something on the bar that you can't handle. And yeah. uh, you work up to it gradually. Uh, yeah. You, powerlifting is a marathon. You take your time to get from point A to point Z. But uh, yeah. improper movement patterns and improper load. And I think I really discussed movement patterns of what, what I can see. There's six or yeah. seven movement patterns I need to have down. Uh, yeah. Yeah, in my coaching model, you, you know, when I program people, it's all centered around primary movement patterns. You know, you got the push, pull, bend, twist, lunge, squat, and gait. And if you can nail all those, you're you're really, really minimizing your risk of injury. And if there's any of those that you're deficient in, it probably puts you deficient in yeah. one or two more of yeah. the other movement movement patterns yeah. as well. So how, how does go ahead, let's go a different direction? So when we talk about injuries in the gyms. I know a lot of people that are injured. You know a lot of people that are injured. Mm -hmm. uh, most of that is because you're not doing it properly. Uh, uh, so some years ago, when when uh, my one coach moved away from town, and I had to find myself a new support system. So I look, looked around the gym, and I looked at people that were dependable and would show up and wanted to learn. And yeah. uh, so that was J Jared, Jared Baird, Austin Kretzler, uh, Lindsey Kaufman. And we started to work together. All three of them came in injured. Uh, so they're not injured now. So one of the first things they worked on was proper movement patterns. And then before long, they're not injured. Yeah. Uh, some of them take longer than others to... Uh, recovery it's all about moving properly yeah yep and you know the the <clears throat> that's the irony in it is it's seen as this maybe injury causing sport but really if done properly and done with integrity it can be very therapeutic you know because yeah. those three movement patterns are are very important uh to lifelong strength uh so before we wrap up dale i, I can't i get this overwhelmed i mean this thought keeps hitting me every time we talk about this and it's it's how powerlifting and, and other other sports, even combat sports like wrestling that you were heavily involved in, how how powerlifting and, and those types of sports really parallel life. There's there's challenges, there's setbacks, there's mountains that look too big to climb, and then sooner or later you find yourself on the top of those mountains. Yeah. So what are, what are your thoughts on that, Dale? How has powerlifting and, and life mirrored its each other uh, through your experience? Well, I'll tell you what, they're closely related. Uh, now, wrestling is certainly tougher than powerlifting. Mm. I mean, when, when I was wrestling, uh, you know, it's not like powerlifting. There's no one trying to trying to pick my legs up on powerlifting. There's no one trying <laughs> to pick me up and throw me down to the mat. There's no one there putting a gut wrench on me and beating the crap out of me. Yeah. But powerlifting is very similar because... Man, it's hard. It's hard. If you want, if you want to get into some aerobics, try doing deadlifts for high reps. Try yeah. doing squats. Man, you just can't do it. So, so when you look at sports, especially wrestling and powerlifting, they teach you to work. They they teach you to work hard. They teach you to uh, learn the fundamentals if you want to success. And, you know that that mirrors life. That that uh, in a job. You need to be able to do the job properly. You need to be open to uh, a higher authority of knowledge. Uh, yeah. 
So, so all of those things, man. Yeah, I think they mirror very closely. Yeah, um, those are those are great points. Great. Yeah, and uh, sport. So, so when we look at wrestling, you know, so so when I was wrestling in in high school, uh, I was on the first wrestling team we had. That was I was a junior, so you can probably figure how much a junior starting a wrestling program and then you're wrestling other people. You might not know a whole lot because you just yeah. started. Well, I went undefeated that year. Within two years, I made my way to college with wrestling. And uh, res wrestling set me up for my life. If it wouldn't have been for wrestling, I probably wouldn't be talking to you today. I mean, yeah. it, it taught me how to work. It taught me how to set goals. Uh, I was always aware that uh, – Yeah, we use job opportunities for this. If there's a job opportunity out there, and if you're not ready for it when it comes open, well, you're not going to get it. So yeah. wrestling helped me to realize that I had to be open. I had to be ready when the opportunity opens up. Yeah, so. that's that's powerful. That's powerful. You know, uh, I think a lot of people, and we're all guilty of this. You know, at points of in our lives where a task seems insurmountable, or we we try and fail numerous yeah. times. Maybe we get injured. Uh, you know, an injury in life might be a loss of a relationship or or status or something like that. But but at the end of the day, I mean, are you going to get back on the mat or are you going to hang your shoes up and yeah, you know, are you going quit? Are you, are, are you going quit or are you going continue? Yeah, yeah. Is that a learning lesson? And yeah, uh, that's what that's one something. thing that that I've learned from you, Dale. And I know. Uh, countless other people have as well. And I can't thank you enough for the influence that you've had on me personally. Uh, and even the influence that I watch you put onto others really puts wind in my sails and really uplifts me uh, and really wants, puts that, puts that, feeds that fire in me yeah. that, that makes me just want to go out and work with people and help people even more than, than I already am. And, and I can't thank you enough for that. And I, I thank you yeah. so much for joining yeah. me today. Uh, yeah. for those of you that, Jerry. oh, it was great. We'll do it again too. I hope, yeah, okay. I'd love to do this again. And, uh, for those of you guys that, that want to follow Dale, go to Facebook. He's, uh, he's pretty active on there. And, uh, Dale, is there, is there anywhere else where you like to hang out or is Facebook kind of your spot? Uh, Facebook's kind of my spot. I okay. do an Instagram, but you know what? I can't figure out how to use it <laughs> in order for like two days. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. You're I'm not pretty, missing I, a whole lot. Yeah. I'm pretty busy. You know, I work four days a week, week lifting weights and it just keeps me busy. Yep. Yep. Busy doing good, virtuous, fulfilling things. Yeah. Too. Yep. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, check him out. You know, it's fun to follow Dale and, and see what he's up to. You can keep, keep up with his, his next meets and, uh, and his, he always posts videos and progress reports of how the meets go. And it's, it's an enjoyable experience. And, and if you follow him long enough, you will be inspired, I promise. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for watching this. If uh, if you would like to share this, if you found value, I'd really appreciate it that. Pre appreciate that. And I know Dale would as well. Uh, you can find me on my website, coachjerryhlc.com. And also, I've just released a 30-minute uh, a blueprint to hack your life and accomplish any, any goals that you have. Uh, you can find that at coachjerryonlineacademy.com. It's about a half hour little tutorial. Uh, it, it, uh, it's kind of my, my first my first online class, so let me know what you think. Uh, feedback's good, bad, and different is, is always appreciated. Uh, but once again, Dale, I'd like to thank you for joining me today. Thank everybody for watching, and we'll yep. do this again real soon. Thanks, Dale. Okay, thank you, Jerry.